kind of wait and see if anybody else wanted to get up and preach today. It's Thanksgiving weekend, uh, but since no one else jumped up, I figured that probably the Lord wants us to hear a little bit of what he uh, has to say to us from what he's been saying to me uh, this week. Uh, I want to take just a few moments. Uh, uh, I, I didn't ask permission to do this, so I may get in trouble afterwards. But uh, we have dear friends, Cade and Sarah Jenkins, uh, that have been coming to our church. Have you guys been here a year? About a year. And they take, have taken a new job up uh, back in northeast Oklahoma. And so probably this will be their last Sunday here with us. And uh, Cade and Sarah, we're going to miss you. And uh, we're sorry to see you go. Glad for you guys, but sorry for us. Uh, you get to be by your family. I know your parents and all of them will enjoy that. So would you say, uh, just say to Cade and Sarah, thanks for being a part of our church. And uh, if you really hadn't had an opportunity to meet Cade and Sarah, I I'm so sorry. It's really uh, kind of your loss because they're a wonderful young couple to get acquainted with. But it just goes to show us it's important for us to get acquainted with one another. And uh, so uh, as you uh, are, particularly during the moments of friendship time, take advantage of that time. And, and you know, some of you, you know each other for, a you've known each other for a long time. You've been around, you've seen each other, you've talked to each other. In fact, some of you talked to each other last night, and then here you are again Sunday morning talking to one another again, which is all right, that's good. We like that you talk to each other, that you're still friends after last night, because some of your houses were divided. <laughs> I was just thinking, you know, it's kind of like getting up here, it's kind of like it's, it, there's four seconds left, and you're behind by seven points. And so i got to figure out the right play to call to score a touchdown. Actually, you know what? I don't have to figure out anything. i just got to trust God to do it. And uh, I, I think he has something he wants to say to our hearts. Uh, it seems like Thanksgiving weekend uh, tends to be all about three things. Eating or turkey, football, and shopping. Now, how many of you watch football over the weekend? Come on, you can confess. It's all right. Now, now what I really want to know is how many of you spent your money, your Black Friday money, money on Thursday night? Yeah. So, and, and who of you are dedicated to be up at 4 a.m. or whatever time on Thursday morning or Friday morning to do that? That early morning shopping. Any, uh, anybody? There we go. All right. Good, good. Well, I already know the answer to this one. How many of you ate this week? Yeah. And uh, we did. We had a great time, an uh, opportunity to visit with my folks for a few hours and spend time with them. And uh, My mom fixes food for an army. There is so much food, and uh, fortunately, we did have a, uh, my uncle came over and brought a friend of his, a 15-year-old that uh, kind of, he's kind of a mentor to, and, and uh, he, he was a big guy, and he liked to eat, so that sure helped us out, uh, because I would have probably had to bring home a lot of leftovers, but uh, Tanner really helped us out at our place, and, and he ate a lot of those mashed potatoes. Um. Oftentimes, we start Advent on this Sunday. The Sunday after Thanksgiving, many times, is the start of Advent. But uh, do you know, do you realize that the earliest that Thanksgiving can ever be is on the 22nd of November, which is this year? And the latest that Thanksgiving can ever be is on the 28th, which is next year, uh, doesn't have anything to do with anything, but I just thought it was kind of interesting that these two years in a row, it's the earliest and it's the latest. I don't know any of you historians, is it always that way? Back-to-back -back years, is it always one year the earliest, and then the, whenever the earliest happens, the next year is the latest? 
Are you there? Well, last week I introduced to you the thought, the idea of thanks living. Uh, and I realize that it's probably not a new idea. There have been many others that have played with the words and come up, came up with the idea of, of taking away the G and adding an L. But I really do believe that it is a lifestyle challenge. A challenge for us to live nuwa. Remember that Hebrew word, nuwa? A shout for joy. And then we would choose to live in his pasture, in his house. I heard someone talking today about house rules this morning. And uh, when we choose to live in his pasture, we choose to live in accordance with his plan for us. And we live with a combination of thanksgiving and praise. That was the word last week from Psalm 100. As I thought about that message throughout the week, it began to occur to me that as I read the letters that the Apostle Paul writes, so many of his letters seems to begin, at least in the early verses of each letter, he oftentimes says, I thank my God for you. In fact, if we, we read it in... Uh, uh, the letter to the Corinthians, I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. To the Ephesians, he says, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. To the Philippians, he writes, I thank my God every time I remember you. To the Colossians, he says, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we Pray for you. To Timothy, he writes, I thank God whom I serve. And to Philemon, he says, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers. And he also says the similar, something similar to the Thessalonians. And we want to read that in just a moment. But it began to occur to me that Paul had reasons... He must have had reasons why he was thankful to God for these people that he was writing. And, and so I begin to wonder, what kind of life were these people living that would make Paul thankful? Did you catch that? What kind of life were the, the Philippians or the Colossians or the Ephesians, what kind of life were they living in such a way that Paul would say, I think my God for you. Well, it began to occur to me that probably then what Paul knew and understood about these people that he was writing, particularly the Thessalonians, it occurred to me that could it be that the Thessalonians were living a thanks-living lifestyle? So I began to try to read the Scripture with that in mind. To begin to look, okay, how is it that these Thessalonians are living in such a way that the Apostle Paul, when he would think about them, when he would pray for them, he would offer up a thanksgiving prayer to God for these people. And so as I begin to think about that, I, I begin to, to ask myself, okay, how is it that, that we should be living what is it that, that we find and discover about the lifestyle of the Thessalonians that can be implemented into the way that I live my life? And so that's what I want to try to accomplish this morning. I, I want us to understand that, in fact, the Apostle Paul will, will read here that he says that they were models to all believers. I don't think it had anything to do with the clothes that they were wearing. It, all, it had to do with the lifestyle that they were choosing to live that impacted all the people that heard about them in Macedonia and Achaia. So, so what is it, how is it that I can live my life? What can you and I do in such a way that we live a lifestyle that when other people see and hear 
about our relationship with God, that they will begin to understand, okay, these people are modeling what it means to be a thanks-living people. So if you have your Bibles, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, the first 10 verses. Now we're going to use all of Thessalonians, but I want to read these first 10 verses to you today. So if you'd like to stand together in honor of the reading of the Word of God. Paul, Silas, and Timothy. To the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you. Mentioning you in our prayers, we continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, for we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you. Because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord in spite of severe suffering. You welcomed the message with joy, with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and the true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. We really need to take some time probably to read the whole letter because it is so incredible. It has so much about the way that as Paul addressed these young believers, trying to help them in their faith. But there's three particular things that he that jumps out early on in this letter as he writes. He says that your work is produced by faith. Your labor is prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope. And so that's, those are the three thoughts that we want to talk about today because it seems to me that those three ideas seem to be the basis for a lifestyle of thanks living. Work produced by faith. Now James said that works... Without faith, excuse me, let me say it right. Faith without works is dead. Did you catch that? James said that if if we are going to have faith, we're going to have works. There is going to be a byproduct of our faith. Now you and I, we believe that our salvation is not determined by what we do. Just because we come to church doesn't mean that we are saved. Just because we give in an offering plate, just because we sing in a choir, just because we teach a Sunday school class, just because we do all of these kind of good works, that does not mean that we are saved. In fact, we cannot be saved through our works or by our works. We are saved by faith. But when we have a faith that is living and active, it will produce works. It will produce fruit that will last. Because we have faith, works is a result of our belief system in God. 
faith, our belief in God, this foundation of our understanding. We are told in chapter 3, verse 2, that Timothy was sent to these young Christians to strengthen and encourage them in their faith. So their faith wasn't complete yet. I think that's something important for us as we think about the way that we live out our life, our faith in Christ. I venture to say that no matter how long we have been Christian, no matter how long we have had a faith in God, whether it be a very short time or a very long time, it's not complete. There are still parts of our faith that need to be developed and strengthened and encouraged. Part of of coming to church is that we might find and strengthen our faith. In chapter 3, verse 9, Paul says, Night and day we pray that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. So here's a couple questions for you this morning. In the midst of this Thanksgiving season, how is your faith in God? What are you doing to build up your faith? And and, and even probably a better question for us as the church. What are we doing to help each other, to help our faith in God to grow up, to be strengthened and to be encouraged? How can we supply what is lacking? I would venture to say... We cannot do it if we are not together. I I was thinking this week, I I met with Sandy and her family. Uh, Sandy's father passed away this week, by the way, and I want to encourage you to pray for Sandy and her family. And, and, And even though I didn't know her dad, I had the opportunity and the privilege of getting acquainted with the family and hearing stories about him. And and they told me that he was a mechanic. And and I began to think about being a mechanic in this faith journey. You know, if something happens to our car, we're driving it, in fact, coming back from Pittsburgh, I saw a couple different cars alongside the road, and, and I wondered, okay, did they break down? And I begin to think about this idea of a mechanic and our faith. If our car breaks down out on the road, we can possibly fix it on the road, but it will be much better if we were able to take it into the shop to a place where there's proper equipment and the mechanic has all the tools that that he needs and has a place to to work and repair the car. And I thought about that in our faith. So often, you and uh, people out in the midst of our world think, well, I can just be a Christian and and not be a part of the church. But the church is, is part of the process that God has to be the mechanics in our life. That the church becomes the place in which our faith is encouraged and strengthened. And the place where we can find and discover what we're lacking in our faith. So I say to us today, it is very important in our faith to be part of a body of Christ that can help us to grow up in our faith. And so I want to, to, you to think about that as, as you think about people that you know in the midst of this journey, people that are living out in, in the world people that do not know Christ, you and I are going to have an opportunity to be a model to them about what it means to be Christian. I I didn't want to go out on Black Friday because I didn't want to be around the crowds. I was afraid that someone may say something to me that, that I would not respond to in a proper way. You see... In that kind of setting, I wouldn't have been a very good encourager of the faith. I wouldn't have been a good role model. 
Now, if I can purpose to go out into that kind of environment, and in fact, this whole shopping season of Christmas, the parking lots will get more crowded. The stores will become more full of people. The lines will become longer. Even if it's just going to buy groceries and we're not going to buy Christmas gifts. And how is it that people will see us in our faith in God? Will we be a model to them of what it means? Our work produced by faith. Secondly, he talks about your labor prompted by love. Our love for God becomes the motivator for the way that we treat others. Our love for God and His love for us must become the motivator for the way that we treat others. Jesus said, Love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. I don't know if you caught it in the midst of what little bit we read, but if you study the life of the Thessalonians, you'll discover that they were being persecuted by their own people because of their faith. And Paul is declaring the only Christ-like response to persecution is to love them. Most of the time, it's easy to love our brothers and our sisters in Christ. Most of the time. And most of the time, it's easy to love our families and even to love our co-workers. Or maybe even we can love our bosses, our employees. But chapter 3, verse 9 says that we are taught by God to love each other. And in fact... Paul says, you do love all the brothers throughout Macedonia, yet we urge you, brothers, to do so more and more. I think Paul was saying, a life of thanks living is a life that cannot love too much. In chapter 5, verse 11, he said, encourage one another and build each other up. Encourage each other and build one another up. So this morning I ask you, church, what does your love look like? What does your love look like? Well, that might cause us to ask the question, well, what is love? Well, it means many different things, but I think to begin with, we could simply say respect. It means that we would treat one another as we would want to be treated. It means building one another up. So if we are living a lifestyle of thankfulness, we will be expressing that through the way that we build relationships and connect and love one another in the church and we love those outside of the church. Practical way here that you can love. We're still looking for three families that will take about three hours on a Sunday afternoon to take a couple kids that you don't know, that's had a really hard time, their parents have been in prison for whatever reason, and to take them to a Christmas party. You see, labor's produced by love. You know, I, I, labor is not fun. As I think of the word labor, I don't think of fun. I think of hard work. I think of determination. I think of something that, that I decide that I'm going to do because I know that it's what I need to be doing. And when we have a love for God, it prompts 
a love for others. And finally, he says in this first few verses that we have an endurance inspired by hope. What is our hope? Can we trust Christ to take care of our world, our homes, our families, our lives? Endurance. It too requires decision and determination. Have you decided? Are you determined? How are we going to live a life of thankfulness? You see, it's not just for a season. It's not just a thing that we program into the calendar because it's Thanksgiving time. I've seen many of you, and, and I know that there are many others that, that, that are not part of our church, and I've read on, on Facebook, day one, I am thankful for. Day two, I am thankful for. We're on day 25 now, and, and probably even some of you have already written on your Facebook, I am thankful for, and, and I, that's great. I think it's a very good thing for us to consciously think about. But thanks living is a lifestyle 12 months of the year, 7 days a week, 24 hours a day. Well, what will you look like if you're thankful while you're sleeping? I don't know. But you get the idea that thanks living is is a lifestyle. It will be a work produced by faith. It will be a love prompted. It will be a labor prompted by love and an endurance inspired by our hope in Christ. Is Jesus the hope of your glory? Paul writes that to the Corinthian people. And he says that our hope is truly in the glory of Christ. Well, we have 10,000 reasons and more to bless the Lord. And as we conclude this Thanksgiving weekend, we are going to be determined to live a life of thankfulness. We're going to sing this song. You probably figured since they're coming up. That's all right. We're going to sing this song, 10,000 Reasons to Bless the Lord. And uh, may the Lord truly be blessed. You know, I've been trying really hard this year that whenever I pray, particularly around mealtimes, because usually it's at mealtimes that we ask the Lord to bless our food. And oftentimes, in the midst of prayer, if you'll listen to people pray, that whenever they ask for the Lord's blessing on the food, many times we will ask for the Lord's blessing upon our lives. And I think that's great. And we truly want to experience God's blessing in us. But I've been trying to pray this year. And Lord... May I be a blessing to you. May I be a blessing to these waitresses. May I be a blessing to my family. Because I have chosen to live a life of thankfulness. 10,000 reasons to bless His name. Let's stand together and sing this this morning. the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. The sun
now. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. there thinking about praying together as a church, thinking about some of the different things that's been going on in some of your lives, and uh, I I think that today I I just want to encourage us to pray over one another. Folks like Kate and Sarah, they're going to be moving. Some of you have gotten to be good friends with them these few short months. Kate and Sarah, can I put you on the spot and ask you to come and kneel around here at the altars and let some of us just gather around you? Chad, I don't know, maybe for you, if uh, if Sandy doesn't feel like coming around, maybe you could be her, uh, her intercessor. I I would like for some of our folks to come and gather around your family and pray for you guys during this time. Putting some of you kind of on the spot here. Robin, can some of us pray for you? Robin's father passed away last month. And uh, so if you could come and bring your family and let some of our folks gather around you today. And Part of the, the value of the church is to gather around one another and As they're coming, some of you gather around some of these folks, and and there's probably some other things going on in your lives that uh, you would like to just be the church and encourage one another. Part of thanks living is lifting one another up and encouraging each other along the way. So I invite many of you that you would like, we're going to sing again, and I'd like to invite you to gather around these folks or just uh, to come and pray. And... uh, Nathan, let's sing this again, and then I'll close our service this morning in prayer. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul sings your praise unending. Ten thousand years.
Father, today as we have gathered together, I am thankful to be part of the body of Christ. I am thankful that you have provided for me a, a place to, to connect and to fit in. Lord Jesus, I, I know that so many of these people don't even begin to grasp what an impact they make on me. And I thank you for their life and their faithfulness. I thank you for their prayers that they lift up to you for me and, and for our church and our congregation. Lord, I thank you for the faith that you have given to us through your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord Jesus, if there be anybody here today that's living in sin and does not have that relationship with you, that there is no foundation for their life, I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would convict them and that they would seek your forgiveness, that they would simply say, Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me of my sins. Come and live in my heart. And that they too may begin this journey in faith. And Father, part of our faith journey is to lift one another up and to encourage each other. Lord, we've prayed and, and brought some of these people down and there are many others among the congregation. And you know each and every need and you know each and every circumstance that we find ourselves in. And Lord, so I pray for your presence upon each and every one here this morning. Lord, I, I pray for particularly today for Robin and Rick and pray that you would encourage them this morning as they continue to grieve. Lord, I pray for Sandy and Chad and their family today. I pray that you would give them strength, that you would comfort them in their mourning. Lord, thank you for the privilege of being a part of Kate and Sarah's life and their kids. And Lord Jesus, we pray that as they go from this place and into a new part of Oklahoma, which is not necessarily new for them. They've been from that area as they return home. I pray, Lord, that you would encourage them, that they would connect and find a, a new body of Christ to become a part of. And Lord, each and every one here today, as I mentioned a moment ago, we've brought our needs before you. And in the midst of our being a needy people, we also want to be a thankful people. Lord Jesus, give us an enduring hope. That may we be determined and may we make the decision to keep our faith and our eyes fixed and focused upon you. And as we prepare to head into this Advent season, as we look at some of the, the Old Testament prophecies in the next few weeks, as we relive and retell the story of how you came to this earth, may we be excited. May we understand the great hope that we have in you. And no matter what we face in the midst of the world, whether it be something like a a rambunctious Black Friday crowd or whether it be a, a football team that, that we support that lost or whether it be the opportunity the opportunity Lord to share with those around us wherever we might be what it means to be Christian maybe not even necessarily with our words but with our life that we will be joyful, that we will be thankful, that we will model what it means to be your follower. Lord, we love you today. Thank you for all the many reasons that we have to bless your name. So Lord, would you go with us? May we be a blessing now to you in the midst of our community. In the midst of our week, may we bless your holy name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Have a great, great day. You are dismissed. May the grace and the peace of our Lord and Savior be with you.